coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap. We've got the latest on the Stack Clash vulnerability affecting a Unix operating system near you. Then, thanks to a recent RNC data leak, we've got your name, address, birthday, and a whole lot more personal information. Plus, Dan does a deep dive into his DNS infrastructure with some recent changes, improvements, and how he's integrated with Let's Encrypt. Plus, we've got your fantastic feedback, a ridiculous roundup, and so much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Welcome to TechSnap, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems, network, and administration podcast. This episode was streamed live on June 20th, 2017, and is brought to you by our three wonderful sponsors, DigitalOcean, Ting, and IX Systems. My name is Wes, and joining me this week, yeah, that's right, it's the one, the only, it's Dan. Welcome to the show, Dan. Dan's here. Hello. Dan's here. Everyone, what a wonderful surprise. Actually, it's not a surprise. We were expecting you. How are you today? I'm good. Excellent. I'm not bad at all. Yeah, we've got like a, a, a awesome show coming up. There's a lot of really good, uh, you know, things that just have happened, and there's one piece in particular I'm quite excited for. You're just trying to tease me. Yeah, maybe so, and maybe the audience too. I guess uh, um, you have anything you want to talk about before we uh, jump? I have in? some new toys that I want oh, to show off. Even better. Okay, yeah. There's a place in Ottawa called Lee Valley Tools. And they do a lot of odd things. They started off, I think, making specialist dental tools. Now, I may be wrong there, but tools is in small, handy, handiwork type stuff. But what I bought from them on this trip was very small, very powerful magnets. And basically, you put that on your cabinet. Sorry, you put that on your cabinet, and then you attach your tool to it. And it lets your tool hang off the side of the rack. It's meant for any type of tool, but I use it on the rack. Yeah, that looks handy. And then the next thing I bought, and this has turned out better than I thought, is a little stack of little plastic boxes like this. And I thought they looked good. And then I opened them and found that they actually have proper hinges. It's not like a plastic thing that bends. But then inside, the dividers can go at all different levels as dictated by these little ridges on the side. So that's one extreme, and that's the other extreme. So this is going to be useful for spare parts and nuts and bolts and stuff for the rack. Oh, yeah, I can imagine tons of stuff where you just want to, especially if you can store it next to it or with it, and then put a nice label on there. Mm, Sounds organized. And up at home for what... uh, a week now. Mm-hmm. I got home a week yesterday, and I haven't touched these. <laughs> well, of course. I'm still trying to catch up. You're a busy man. Not yes. the least of which has been showing, you know, helping prepare the uh, fantastic show we have here today. Speaking of the show. Yeah, speaking of the show. What do you have for us up first? I think I first heard about this yesterday or the day before. I mean, it wasn't. it wasn't... It may sound very vague since there's a published date on of it yesterday. Oh, yeah, okay, it was yesterday. It was released yesterday morning. So it's been out almost, I'm going to say, 36 hours by the time the end of this show is. And it's basically a stack clash. And we've talked about stacks and we've talked yes, about, we have. Uh, I forget, stacks grew in one direction, something else grew in the other. And if they meet, you're in trouble. Uh, that's what this takes care of. That That is what this exploits. And th- this isn't new. What's new is the way that they're exploiting it because it's been done a couple of times before. But it's called um, a stack clash. And it was done by uh, Qualsys. Qual- Qualys. Yeah, that's a hard one to they're, say. Yes. Their uh, blog, uh, their research team came out with it yesterday. But... Um, it's been going on for a while. It's been going on since May. Um, so let let me start reading the first bit here, and you, everyone will have a good idea of what it is. And from what I understand, this affects a lot of OSs. And during the research, they found a lot of vulnerabilities in other code as well, not just OS, but stuff like sudo. <clears throat> 
The stack clash is a vulnerability in the memory management of several operating systems. It affects Linux, OpenBSD, NetBSD, FreeBSD, and Solaris on both i386 and AMD64. It can be exploited by attackers to corrupt memory and execute arbitrary code. So it's your yep. classic thing. Now, they're saying the idea of clashing the stack with another memory region, region is not new. They, they're saying clash, but uh, it's still just, I forget what I used to call it ages ago. I knew it as something else. But this was first, first exploited in 2005, and it was in a paper that was presented at Kensec West, which I have heard of before, and a second time in 2010. And it wasn't until after the 2010 exploit that Linux introduced a protection, and they call this a stack guard page. And oh what yeah, I remember in, when that was introduced, right? Yep. Yeah. You've been using Linux that long? No, but I remember I've I've read about it. I, okay. So, in this paper, they basically show that stack clashes are widespread and exploitable despite the stack guard protection. So. What, what's important to note is that this is not one vulnerability. So the stack clash vulnerability has one number, and it demonstrates that a stack guard page of a few kilobytes is insufficient. But during the research, they found a whole lot of other vulnerabilities, some of which are just secondary to this and are directly related to the primary vulnerability, but some are exploitable independently. Uh, for example, there's one in sudo, which is related to uh, input validation and embedded spaces in the uh. get process TTY name function, which results in information disclosure and command execution. So you're going to have to upgrade sudo soon. Uh, what's good, though, is that they have not released any of the uh, sample code yet. They're waiting for everyone to get patched first. Um, so who's affected? Linux, OpenBSD, NetBSD, FreeBSD, Solaris on both AMD and 64. Other operating systems and architectures may be vulnerable too, but we have not researched any of them yet. Please talk to your vendor, is what they're saying. Uh, now, I do know, I read uh, elsewhere in the original blog post, yes, the original blog post, um, that they tested Apple... Uh, or, or they alerted Apple and Google. So there were th those groups are working on it um, by themselves. So basically, okay, so this is an exploit. Do I have to worry? Well, yes, everyone has to worry. If you have users on your system other than you, you definitely have to worry. If you have no local users, it's a little bit more remote, and we'll get into that because there are remote it, remote. Exploits are possible, but they haven't found it, found any yet. They tested one, and by sheer luck, it, it wasn't vulnerable. So the exploits and proofs of concept that we developed during the course of our research are all local privilege ex es uh, escalations. An attacker who has any kind of access to an affected system can exploit the stack clashed vulnerability and obtain full root privileges. Uh-oh. So... This is a huge deal. Yeah, that is a huge deal. So, as of June nineteenth, they didn't know about any remote exploits, but local exploitation will be always easier. Remote exploitation will be very application specific. Mm -hmm. The one remote application that we did investigate, the XM mail server, turned out to be unexploitable by sheer luck. I want to know why they say sheer luck. Yeah, what I do they mean know. by that? I, I want to know more about that. Maybe something, you know, uh, so, some, mm. something that, that ended up defeating it but wasn't designed to, I suppose. So, how can you protect your system? Basically, patch it when the vendor starts releasing mm. patches and do it immediately. Um, they say here that they've been working with the affected vendors since the beginning of May. So, what's that? Let's call that six weeks. Hmm. maybe seven weeks, depending on what they define the beginning of May as. So by the time you read this, their patches and updates will be available. Have you seen any patches or updates? I haven't. No, I haven't either, at least not that I've been aware of. 
today is Tuesday, so yeah, I'm, but- I'll expect something in my mailbox by tomorrow morning. And I think I'm going to be spending a lot of tomorrow upgrading systems. <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, what if I? So, sorry. I mean, but that's not you know that's the uh, mm-hmm. that's the uh, mm-hmm. the work end of patch your shit. It- Everyone will be getting them at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Including the bad guys who will look at the patches and say, oh, so that's, that's how what it is. Happened. Yeah, exactly. Which is fun in and of itself. So, how can you, the dear listener, protect your system from the stack clash? Simple. It's three words. Three words? Three words. Patch your shit. The easiest and safest ways is to protect your system is to update it, but it's not available yet. Oh, I already went through that. What if I can't or don't want to update or reboot my system? Well, Dan comes around, and then he's going to reboot your system for you. So yep. it's just going to yep. happen. So watch out. That's 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 just systems that don't get patched. The Dan fairy. I was going to say something mean about people that don't want to, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can't. So they talk about the hard R limit stack and R limit AS of local users and remote services to some reasonably low values. But then they go on to say that reasonably low values may break your applications because um, the sudo stack clash exploit allocates only 137 meg. That's not a lot. No. So what they so yeah, what they're doing is they're allocating. Now I know what I wanted to say earlier. So let's assume the stack grows down to the top of memory and heap grows up from the bottom. Sometimes it's the other way around, but that's not relevant. So what happens to clash with the stack is you allocate a whole bunch of memory in the heap. You get in there and you overwrite the stack with the very specific things that you want. And then when it goes to return, it winds up executing your program and jumping into your code and doing something exactly what you wanted to do. That was an amazing, like... 10 second summary of this vulnerability and it makes me think we should start doing that more often like just make you explain these things but in just a tiny amount of time because that was perfect all right thank you so that's basically how it works it wasn't until i read heap that i remembered oh yeah that's the mm-hmm. um so where can you find the cache stack stack clash exploits you can't they haven't published published them yet and that is good I'm very pleased they haven't published it yet. Right, we're giving people so, some time here to, to get the updates rolled out and people some time to patch. Yep. And, yeah. Yep. Um, someone says that the Debian updates are available. Okay. So let's just click in here and see if it is. Security update. Uh, I don't see any patches. What uh, have been fixed in 316? Yep. Th- yep. 31643 and 4930 are available. Excellent. Are they available? Hmm. Or will be soon. Now, how is this a problem? It's a problem because they thought they had a fix for, for stack clashes and it was wrong. That's why it's a problem. I mean... Yeah, can you go more into the history of that? In, in the hit the back history of the various things yeah. yeah well the previous one I have that here let me see the first time I didn't I didn't read much into this I stopped at the part where I saw it was Ken West <coughs> so basically it was 12 years ago uh, last month early last month um, and I haven't read this much but basically they started saying that now we're getting into large memory sizes and uh, with 64-bit CPUs are going on about that and unexploitable bugs may be exploited to run arbitrary code in a process. So basically you've got a bug in the program which you can then use to escalate something else to become a privileged user. So previous bugs, old bugs didn't really cause any problem but now that you've got this um, stack clash ability, it makes it even worse. Um, it reminds me, Colin Percival always used to say he always patches every bug that comes through because you never know how that bug may be used in conjunction with something else to gain root privileges. And that that's the big issue. It's not, it, it's not that just this little bug 
that may be the problem. It's the escalation of the bugs. It, it, it's classic, and it reminds me of uh, most car collisions or downing of airlines aren't a single thing that goes wrong. It's a chain of things that all go wrong in just the wrong way that lead to disaster. And that's basically the same thing uh, that Colin is getting at. Patch it, regardless of whether or not you think you're vulnerable, because someone may come up with a damn clever way of leveraging that bug to get to a more serious bug and then get root. Exactly. And I, I mean, I think people underestimate that sometimes, how easy it is to happen or we'll write it off. And, you know, if you forget about that, suddenly, you know, one vulnerability comes around, you're like, well, okay, but yep. it, that probably won't happen. You forget about it, don't patch. And then another one comes and then suddenly you've got this chain and boom, <sighs> you're screwed. And that's yep. pretty easy to have <clears throat> happen. But, you know, it really goes to show that you really should be thinking about updates, thinking about patching, making it a regular part. You have to plan for it you know, all along so that your deployments can tolerate it, so that your reliability can tolerate it. And if you don't build it into the process, then you're, it's always going to be a big pain point. Sometimes a, pat, uh, a patch will come out and say, it says, if you're not running this thing, you're not vulnerable. Yeah, right, yes. But, I, I patched that anyway because, well, one day I may run it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a, almost always a better idea if you can uh, process with standing, you know, to uh, keep up to date with your software. Yep. And I didn't go into much detail about the, the previous times this was exploited. The, the first time, it, it, it sounds like people really didn't take it seriously because it wasn't until five years later that Linux introduced uh, protection against it. Now, I don't know when other operating systems introduced their uh, stack, clash guards, that's what they're calling it. Maybe called something else in other operating systems. And I do know that in some places, these things are not always enabled by default, namely FreeBSD. But we'll see. We'll see what fixes are coming out and how well that will um, repair FreeBSD. Because I'm, I'm positive tomorrow I will have patches waiting for me. Yeah, next week maybe we can touch base on that. And exactly, you know, now's the time you can go head on over to your your distribution or operating system of choice. Check their pages. You know, here's the um, you know the Ubuntu's got their page out talking about this uh, CVE, and you know they've got that kind of information where you can see, hey, does it need to? You know, does this happen on this OS? Are we vulnerable? A lot of these are like needs triage upstream and those sorts of things. So we're still waiting for some patches. Go check with your uh, your operating system and stay tuned for more. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else to add? Uh, there's really nothing you can do but wait. You, there's just, if you want to try those uh, R limit stack and R limit AS, go for it. But I have a feeling that you're going to break more stuff than it fixes. Yeah, that that's fair. Worth trying. And if you do, hey, send us some feedback about it. Uh, you know, or you've experienced pain patching or all those things. We'd love to hear about it. And, you know, maybe now you're thinking, you're starting to think a little bit more consciously about security. You want to make sure that everyone you work with thinks consciously about security. Boy, you should just head on over to our first sponsor tonight. That's our friends at DigitalOcean.com. Yeah, that's right. DigitalOcean.com. There, you can go get yourself some cloud computing designed for developers. They make it so simple, so easy, and so fast to get started with your, you know, cloud virtualization. And they have been expanding rapidly. You can use our promo code SNAPOcean. Yeah, that's right. SNAPOcean, one word, all lowercase. That gets you started with a $10 credit. And you can start taking advantage of some of the awesome services DigitalOcean has available. Things like 55 seconds to spin up a droplet of your choice. Yeah, that's right. 55 seconds. That includes things like FreeBSD, Ubuntu, Debian, Container Linux, Fedora, all kinds of options available to you. Pretty much any OS that you're going to want to run, DigitalOcean has it. And they use real, powerful KVM virtualization. They, that's right. None of this OpenVZ stuff. It's not a container. It's hardware virtualization. That means you can run pretty much whatever operating system you want. OpenBSD, yeah, do it. Go for it. Arch Linux, you can do that too. Pretty cool. That just shows that DigitalOcean, they're doing it right. They're using the right fundamentals. They uh, they run the same hardware that we're interested in, the same software that we're interested in, really know what they're doing. You can follow them on social media and see some of the beautiful data centers they have. And 
check out all the awesome new features they're launching, like object storage. Sign up for early access and get one terabyte free. What is object storage? It's the simplest way to cost to effectively store, serve, backup, and archive a virtually infinite amount of media, web content, images, and static files for your web applications. You're probably familiar with some of these services from competing cloud vendors. I think this really goes to show, you know, with other recent things like cloud firewalls that they've just rolled out, monitoring services, load balancing, attachable block storage. They've really got it all. It's a modern cloud. It's super intuitive. And it doesn't have one of these crazy APIs, DigitalOcean Dogfoods. They use their own API to build their UI, their whole website, their apps. It's really first class. It's a joy to use. It's supported in a ton of things. You're using Terraform or Ansible or Chef or any of these solutions. There's a ton of support. There's lots of wrappers. There's API support just about everywhere. There's phone apps. It's super easy to get started with. You get a $10 credit with our promo code SNAPOcean. So what are you waiting for? 55 seconds, you'll have a brand new thing. You can throw it away. They've got monthly pricing or hourly pricing. You can go over to their pricing page, check that out. It's super easy to get started. So don't wait. Go over to DigitalOcean.com, use our promo code SNAPOcean, and have some fun. All righty then, on to our next story today. What's next? The next is terrible. <laughs> That's no good. Um, I don't want to hear that, Dan. Why? 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 Why are you? Why are you saying these things to me? Well, I'm positive I'm not in this data because I'm not the target market. Okay. Well, that's I guess a silver lining that doesn't help the basically, audience, though. Yeah. Basically, this affects over 61 percent of the U.S. population, and chances are it's only U.S. individuals in here. If you're not in the U.S., you're probably not affected by this. But basically, it's voting, uh, potential voter information. It's information that was collected not by, but on behalf of the um, Republican uh, National Committee. Um, basically, they're collecting all this information about uh, voters. Uh, all, all parties do this. But they left it, ex it, they didn't leave it exposed, but someone left it exposed. Basically, it contains the sensitive personal details of over 198 million American voters who's left exposed to the internet by a firm working on behalf of the Republican National Committee, the RNC. And this data was stored in a publicly accessible cloud server owned by Republican data firm Deeproot Analytics. Now, it's important to remember it's not just going to be Republicans in this database. It's going to be across the whole spectrum of voters because they're not only, you're not only interested in your own party. You're interested in the other parties and the independents as well. So this information included names, dates of birth, home addresses, phone numbers, and voter registration details as well as data described as modeled voter ethnicities and religions. So basically, it's everything they could gather about you legally. Now, the RNC data repository would ultimately acquire roughly 9.5 billion data points regarding three out of every five Americans scoring 198 potential US 198 million potential US voters on their likely political preferences using advanced algorithmic modeling across 48 different categories now if you if you pull up the website on the screen and scroll down just maybe two pages and there you'll see a sort of rough idea of how it is is the thing on the left, which basically describes, you know, their approximate number of voting records is 200 million. They get 198 million of those. Now, it, I, I'm not saying that there's 200 million registered voters. I don't know why they're saying this, but basically, this is 99% of the data that they're talking about. So this, this is an incredible treasure trove not just to political pundits, because I'm sure 
the Democrats would be interested in this data. But this is a great source of information for anyone wanting to do identity theft. This means that two-thirds, what was it, two-thirds they said? Let me go up here. Where did they say that? Yes, 61%. So 60% of the U.S. population, your name, address, date of birth, was in this database and stolen by who knows who. These may not have been the first people to find it. Hopefully they were, and nobody else got it. But when you've got stuff like this out there in the unsecured like that, this is intensely irresponsible. And I would say it's criminal. I would like to see laws that that prosecute well, maybe there are existing laws that will prosecute this, but Yeah, you know, I've I'm seen sure some like discussion about how, you know, like a lot of this data was public or could be gathered in a lot of other ways, which like, okay, yeah. But the net effect of it is is really not is not good. And it is, you know, maybe if, you know, it would not have prevented someone who was being targeted necessarily, uh, but it makes it so, the barrier to entries are so much lower now because all of this information is one place. It's just a, a scammer's paradise. Yep. Oh, look what I have here. All this data. Um, it's not so much the collection of the information which should be illegal. That's a different issue. Making it insecure and available to anyone is not responsible whatsoever. Um, one of the interesting bits that they found in this data was a large cache of Reddit posts saved as text. Oh. And I haven't really looked in into what it said, but have you downloaded this data? But no, I'm just looking at the screenshot they left. I'm sure that by the time this was made public, the data was not available. Um, they actually go over that bit. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that just next. But why they're saving Reddit posts, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, Maybe you can see this. In just a, interesting. a bunch Maybe of encoded using, here. Yeah. So it would take two days from June 12th to June 14th for Vickery. He was the guy that discovered this to download 1.1 terabytes of publicly accessible files, which included two critical databases called Data Trust and Target Point. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So do we know that this is legit data? Do, do, is, this, is this fake or is it real? Well, Deep Root Analytics confirmed that they owned and operated the DRDW bucket, which is subsequently secured against public access the night of June 14th, shortly after Vicaroy noted f federal authorities. So hold on. He discovered this uh, on the 12th and alerted them on the 14th. Now, which day of the week is that? The 14th is a Tuesday. He discovered it on Sunday, and he let them know on the 14th. So, okay. So if he found it on the 12th, what's to say no one else found it? In the meantime, we don't know how long this was unsecured. It's feasible that this this was sitting there unsecured since the election. And there are a lot of people that scan Amazon web space just for stuff like this. And it's not just Amazon that this stuff is done on. It's any cloud system. You wind up scanning a lot of this to see what you can find. Yeah, cloud systems, file hosts, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, th those are all the exact places where people will throw things thinking, well, no one's looking for these stuff, but it's pretty pretty cheap. You can write a crawler and try to identify some uh, in interesting information. Mm -hmm. Now, getting into some of the more interesting bits, mm -hmm. consisting primarily of two file repositories, a 256 gigabyte folder for the 2008 election and a 236 gigabyte folder for oh. the 2012 election, each consisting of 51 files, one for each state as well as DC. Each file formatted as a CSV lists an internal 32-bit character alphanumeric value deemed to be the RNC ID. Okay. You probably have an RNC yeah. ID. Yes, you, the one that's listening to me. Each one of you has an RNC ID. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, I've always wanted one. That's been my dream. For, exam yeah. For example, and they, they give one. Used to uniquely identify every potential voter in the database. And so 
the RNC IDs uniquely link disparate data sets together, combining dozens of sensitive and personal identifying data points, making it possible to piece together a striking amount of detail on individual Americans specified by name. Now, is this data real? Well, first we've got uh, the company admitting, yes, this is our data. Then both Vickery and the reporter of this article look themselves up in these spreadsheets, confirming that the titles, that the files contained accurate and sensitive personal information. Then they go on and they list all, all this data that they have. And I'm going to guess it's about 30 lines, about eight pieces of information per line. That's just the headers. So I'm going to say they have 100 to 300 bits of data about you, some of which were really interesting like religion and whether you're not on the do, do, whether or not you're on the do do not call list uh, your registered party phone number self-reported racial demographic voter registration status stuff like that now then it goes into a whole bunch of background which I didn't want to go into so is the data real yes it is this reporter was able, after ter determining his RNC ID, to view his modeled policy preferences and political actions as calculated by Target Point. That's one of the companies involved in this. It is a testament both to their talents and to the real danger of this exposure that the results were astoundingly accurate. So, it's not so much that it's publicly available information, but it's the policy preferences that may not be public. So they're guessing as to what your, say, policy preferences are, and that information is there and available to anyone that wanted to look at it. So the reporter then goes on is, so what? Why should I care? Here's why you should care. This exposure raises significant questions about the privacy and security Americans can expect for their most privileged information. It also comes at a time when the integrity of the U.S. electoral process has been tested by a series of cyber attacks, cyber assaults against state voter databases, sparking concern that cyber risk could increasingly pose a threat to our most important democratic and government institutions. So basically, if they can gather all this information, what's to prevent them from targeting you with various propaganda? And that's what I'm calling it, propaganda, not fake news, but propaganda. That such an enormous national database could be created and hosted online, missing even the simplest of protections against the data being publicly accessible is troubling. Yeah, I'm it quoting definitely here. is, right? The ability to collect such information and store it insecurely calls further into question the responsibilities owned by private corporations and political campaigns to those citizens targeted by increasingly high-powered data analytics operations. So basically, it's one thing for you to guess at what I can do or what my feelings are on particular topics. It's another thing entirely to put it in a database and then not even secure it. Right. That's I mean, in effect, you're almost saying. publishing my, those those guesses of yours about what my things are and in a manner where you may not be clearly delineating what's a guess and what's um, you know supposed to be factual information. And there was no attempt made at, um, I forget the term, where you basically hide the identity of the person. Um, like an anonymization process or something. Right. Mm -hmm. They didn't go through that at all. They had names and addresses, RNC ID, look it up, there's your information. Right. So what, maybe we need to, to you know, uh, get these guys some contractors who can, you know, show them how to use AWS a little bit better. Or they can go try out that early access of DigitalOcean's object storage and get the security right. No, that won't help. There's one last sentence mm -hmm. I want to quote, or partially quote. The, the one, oh yeah, and then I want to question the 198 figure. The 198 million Americans affected span the entire political spectrum. Their information revealed regardless of their political beliefs so that like i said before this is not just one party mm -hmm. that's 
that's affected here. Um, now, I'm, I'm sure they did their calculations right, but the fact that there is data from the 2008 and 2012 elections, I hope they didn't add that together and come up with a 198 million figure. Otherwise, it's only half of that. Do you, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. That they could have mistakenly said, oh, look, we've got Right, but that's not that's not records unique here, records or yeah. unique people or yeah, right, definitely. But still, they would have counted up the RC and RNC IDs, I'm sure, and mm -hmm. got it that way. It really but, does. Uh, it really does like violate some some trust, I think, in just like maybe even if we're okay as a society with you know political organizations doing some level of this kind of organizing to help them you know obviously they want to they want to find people to support them they want to be able to go door to door all of those things which i understand are you know lawful political activities but there's kind of these assumptions that they'll treat that data cautiously that it'll only be used for you know a certain set of actions and when it's exposed like this it's really it really violates that trust big time yeah and yeah um I'm guessing that if this was to go to court for all the, the all this data breach, uh, the individual companies might get prosecuted, but nothing will happen to the politicians or well, the, no. more correctly, the RNC. Nothing will happen to the RNC. Yeah, no, certainly, certainly not, or Amazon for that matter. Yeah, no, Amazon is completely blameless mm -hmm. here. So we'll see. I'm sure there will be more information come out of this. And somewhere down the trail, we'll hear about people being um, exploited based on this information. I have no doubt. Yes, yeah. it's. I mean, it's it's very much like uh, you know privilege escalation and other things that you can chain together. This is just another piece where you can help. You know, it gives you that extra a bit of information that you can use to uh, pretend to be that person, so you can shut off their water bill or or whatever it is that's happening. They all it all comes together in the end for unpleasant things, and then we get to talk about it right here on the TechSnap program. So it's a lot of fun for everyone. So can you imagine someone that wants to go into, wants to hide for whatever reason? If you want to hide, you can't vote because your name yeah. and address have to be public. Mm -hmm. that's, anyway. that's a very good point. Pet, pet peeve, pet <laughs> peeve. <laughs> All right. Anything else before we move on? Uh, no. And I'm very sorry for everyone whose data got spilt on this is terrible thing to have happen yeah and I, I, I just under yeah exactly just people skeptical of uh you know the internet internet security their privacy online mm -hmm. it just it just makes that whole thing worse uh what's that website H have i been pwned yeah something like that i think that is that what it is i think it is that i'll be interested to see if i get a notice from them about this because i shouldn't be in there because i can't vote Yes, have have I been pwned dot com. Check if your email has been compromised. I'm wondering if he'll get if he will get that information though. Yeah, that's a good question. That, that requires being in uh, being in the right database, getting that informed, adding to the second database, etc. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad that the service is like that. That's a good one. Thank you for reminding me. Awesome. Okay. Well, with that, uh, let's move on to our next sponsor this evening. That's our friends over at Ting. Head on over to techsnap.ting.com to find a smarter way to do mobile. The average Ting bill starts at just $23 per phone per month. And if you go to techsnap.ting.com, guess what? Guess what? Because you're really cool. You're a wonderful TechSnap listener. Ting knows that. We know that. We all love you. We want to give a little back. Ting wants to give a little back. So you get. If you sign up with Ting and you, use, you go to techsnap.ting.com, you will get a $25 service credit. And when the bill just starts at $23 per phone per month, that's a heck of a deal. If you want to learn more, just go over to techstamp.com and click the What Would You Save button. There you'll pop over to their rates page, which is a fun interactive page where you can find out just how much, inf how much you would save each month. And Ting makes it so simple. That's what I love about Ting. It's pay for what you use. So lines start at just $6 a month. Doesn't matter how many. What do you want? Just $6 per device. Then, how many minutes do you want? 100, 500, 1,000, or maybe no usage. Yeah, that's my category right there. Same thing for text messages. And finally, your megabytes. Uh, then maybe that gets me a little bit. Maybe I, maybe I use two gigs a month. Uh, kind of a heavy hitter. I haven't been around Wi-Fi this month. Whatever. Your bill is still only 
$26 per month. Now, there might be some taxes, some fees. That'll depend on your area. Ding can't do anything about that. But they, what they can do is make it super simple to get started. You can just sign up. There's no contracts. There's no early termination fees. Your service will come with all the extras and features you've come to expect from a major carrier. You get voicemail, three-way calling, and you get tethering because Ting keeps it simple. Data is just data. You don't have some magic separate tethering bucket that you can only use so much of or it'll get throttled or you have to pay extra to get it added to your plan. No, no, come on. No, that's silly. That's like 1990s wireless, guys. Ting's better than that. Ting's modern. They're hip. They've got an awesome web dashboard. They've got beautiful apps, and they've got top-notch customer service. They don't have to spend all their capital building new lines. No, Ting resells, right? So they've got they've got a CDMA network. They've got a GSM network. Whatever you want just makes it super simple. Maybe CDMA is a little bit better for you. Maybe you really love GSM. You've already got a GSFM phone. Bring that phone. Yeah, just bring it. Bring it right on. Ting probably supports it. They make it really easy to check or... You can go buy a new phone. Yeah, that's right. Just pop on over to the Ting store. It's at uh, ting.com. Well, techsnap.ting.com. Go to their store page. Go to shop. And you can buy some SIM cards. You can buy the brand new Apple iPhone 7 Plus. And you'll see they've just applied our special offer. That's right. That's right. Ting's making it super simple to get that $25 service credit. Make it super simple to get started, no matter what's better for you. And I think you'll be happy. You'll realize that, you know, without having to invest in all those all those new polls, they can really focus on their customer service. They can make it super simple for you. They can make sure you talk to a real human who's dedicated, who wants this service to make make it work. Tink's parent company, Two Cats, they've been around for a long time. They know how they know how the internet works, they know how the modern person works. They're cord cutters just like us. So head on over to techsnap.ting.com. Get started. Let them know you appreciate them sponsoring the Tech Snap, Tech Snap program and Come get to 21st Century Mobile. I think you'll like it a lot. All right. Thank you, Ting. Now, now, for the segment of the show I'm most excited about. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Dan's DNS. Um, am I right there? Am I right? Or am I just leading yes. people on here? Uh, some, someone suggested, uh, and I, I apologize for not having the name here, but someone suggested to talk about DNS, and I thought today would be a good day. Awesome. Um, I remember first playing around with DNS and thinking, oh my god, this is so complex. <laughs> but I remember reading a I'll book. I'll just remember the IP address. Just screw it. I'll just, it's fine. And, and I cannot remember which book it was. And the books I have here for demonstrating DNS are not at all about DNS. Um, specifically. Um, DNS stands for Domain Name Services. Now, someone may correct me and say, no, that's not quite right. But basically, a domain name. I have langel.org. So my name happens to be my domain name. And most people probably can't get their name as a domain name now. But let's assume you could. So you register the domain name. You get hold of it, and you say, well, I'm going to host this somewhere. And you buy a website from someone, and chances are they'll take care of the DNS for you. But let's pretend that you're taking care of the DNS. Why do you have to worry about DNS? Well, you may use www.langel.org, but the underlying stuff on your computer doesn't use that at all. It uses an IP address, and we're going to ignore IPv6 for this. We're only going to use IP4. What's the difference between that and that? That's about the difference. So IP4 addresses are easily thought of in terms of four sets of one to three digit numbers. So, for example, 10.0.0.1 is a perfectly valid IP address. It happens to be non-routable, which means you can't, can't, someone on the internet can't use that IP address to find something somewhere else on the inter internet. It's only basically for stuff that you control. So we're going to ignore that side of it for now, too. But 
we're only going to be using non-ratable addresses in this example. Otherwise, you're going to wind up on someone else's website. So if you were to look up the IP address for google.com and type that IP address into your address header of your browser, you would probably get to that website. So, but why enter in something that may be 12 digits, 12 different digits? Not only is it A, hard to remember, and B, very error prone. Everyone just likes to type a domain name instead because everyone can remember google.com or apple.com. Plus, depending on what part of the world you are, it may take you to an entirely different web server. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Depending on where you live, a given host name may not be the same. Yeah, there's a lot that's of because, issues like with, with with that you know global that kind of thing or mm -hmm. fancy load balancers that'll mix up yep. which IP is serving that site at a certain time. Yeah. So, someone living say in Australia may not want to talk to a Google server in the U.S but they may be able to talk to something local. Mm -hmm. And that's how they break up the DNS. They break, break it up according to different parts of the world. But we're not getting into that part. We're just going to assume that you want your domain name to resolve to a given IP address that sits, say, in a digital ocean droplet out there somewhere. So the easiest way to think of DNS is as a phone book. And this is not a phone book. It's DNS hack, B, sorry, BSD hacks. Oh man, but that's awesome. Think think of DNS as being a phone book, and think of each domain as being a different town in a different country. And so each town has its own phone book, and the contents of that phone book are managed by that town. So substitute town for individuals that own domains and you have the sort of an idea of, of how phone books work. So the first idea when you want to look up a domain is you have to find out which phone book it's written down in. Fortunately, there's a directory of phone books. Case in point, if you want to know the name servers for langel.org, you literally go to the dot name server, but everyone has all that fitted in. Really? The, uh, imagine langel.org dot. There's an imaginary dot at the end of every domain name or host name. It goes all the way up to the dot. And theoretically, that dot server can be queried. Realistically thinking, speaking, all the DNS servers have that information locally cached. So they go out to those servers and say, okay, who handles .org? Who has a list of all .org domains? That happens to be Affilius, somebody that I worked for once. Affilius manages all the .org domains, so you ask Affilius. And it's stated somewhere, uh, all the .orgs. So this is like a... Uh, a phone book of phone books, let's say. So you query a .org server to say, who handles DNS for langel.org? And they look it up in their records because I've gone and registered langel.org and said these name servers will handle the DNS for langel.org. So you query affiliate servers for .org and it says, hey, you want to talk to either this DNS server or this DNS server or this DNS server. Any one of them will tell you the details for Langel.org. And you say, oh, okay, well, I'm going to talk to this DNS server. And you send a query to it, and the DNS resolver that's sitting on there opens up the book, looks up langel.org and says, oh yes, www.langel.org resolves to 10.0.0.1. And that gets sent back to your browser and your browser then says, oh, okay, well, take me there and I'm looking for www.langel.org at 10.0.0.1. It 
guess. So the web server, the web server says, hi, I'm here. I resolve things for, la uh, sorry, I, I'm a web server and I deal with this and this and this. And it says, oh, okay, that's on my list. Here you go. There's a web page for www.langel.org. And you're done. That's it. So that's sort of how DNS works when you're in your browser going somewhere. There's a whole lot more detail that goes on, but that's the basic gist of it. You enter in a domain name into your browser. Your, brow your, your browser, I say your browser, but it's actually a resolver somewhere within your computer or maybe upstream at your ISP or something. But basically, it gets to a resolver. And what a resolver does, it takes the domain name and looks up the values for it. The first step is to find out where it's supposed to look this up. And the first step is finding out what your name servers are. So what's on your name servers? A zone file. They call it a zone file because there can be different zones within a domain. Generally, I have one file per domain. Usually, it ends in .db. It's just convention. But it's just a plain text file. It's structured a certain way, and it has things like A records and t text records and C name records. Those aren't really important, but when you come across them, you remember. But usually the, the most important thing is you'll have an A record for your web server. And you go in there and you look up, DNS will look up the A record and send you to the right place, which in this case will be www.langel.org, A, some timeout value, and then 10.0.0.1. You've got to remember the semicolon at the end if you're using bind. You'll get caught by that more than once. Is it a semicolon at the end? I can't remember. I'd have to look at a zone file. But what is interesting is the fact that DNS is very resilient. For a given domain, it's recommended that you have at least two name servers. I have three or four or five for some of mine. Yeah, it seems DNS like three servers. or four is pretty common these days. Yeah. Now, I made some notes here. Mm -hmm. I used to run a single name server at home. Mm-hmm. And everything at home was put in there. But then it got complex because I would have DNS servers out there for the public and then name servers here at home for me. And so I would have to update. Oh, now you're keeping all this state a file synchronized here and a file them. there. And it was separate. And mm -hmm. that sounds it, like it a was, pain. It was a pain. So eventually I introduced a dot int. Suffix prefix. Oh, okay. So, and then one weekend I just moved everything that wasn't public into the dot int, and that made it easy mm -hmm. because now I no, no longer at home had anything that referenced public stuff. I just had int dot unix at home dot org internal. Okay, that's nice. I've done something kind of similar, like with the but like home dot. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Okay, that's great. So. It's dot .int. So on my name servers here at home, I'll have Unix at home. I'll have int.unix at home.org. And then a whole bunch of stuff in there. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I have uh, dns01.int.unix at home.org and stuff like that. And it's all just internal here. All on non-writable IP addresses like 10.0.0.1. Right. It all, it all references your local LAN network there. All references internal. Now... There's other interesting things you can do with DNS. So not only can you have a domain name point at an IP address, you can have an IP address point at a host name. So you can have an entry. It's called a PTR record for pointer. You can have a pointer record that points from 10.0.0.1 to www.langel.org. So theoretically, if you did type in 10.0.0.1 into your browser, it would take you to www.langel.org. Not really. It's just taking you to that IP address, but that is another way of thinking of it. Now, me liking source control, I put all my zone files into CVS originally and then eventually into, into SVN. And why did I do that? Move to so get already. 
Sorry, what? go on. Nothing. No, nothing. I didn't say anything. Uh, uh, the fresh ports code is on Git. It's on GitHub. But no, no rush to go to S from SVN at home. So for a while, for a while there, I had a, a traditional master slave uh, configuration. So basically, you can say this DNS server is the master. You only make your changes on the master, and then it notifies all the slaves. Hey, you, I've got new data here. Come and get it. And that's all in the configuration on the master. You can say, uh, you, you're allowed to transfer this data to those slaves. And you tell the slaves, hey, listen, get your data from here. And every once in a while, they'll query the master to see if they're update, up, if they have the latest stuff. And you can also configure the master to notify the slaves and say, hey, over here, come get your data. It's ready. Um, and... I have been talking recently about going to a Let's Encrypt setup, and that makes this master-slave relationship all the more important. Uh, I had gotten away from master-slave when I went to SVN, where basically now my solution was to go to my dev server, make changes to the zone files, then SSH in, into each DNS server, right. SVN up the zone files, and then... Basically, like whatever was in your Reload. source control would always be yep. what was loaded to each DNS server. Correct. Okay, that makes sense. It's a nice. It makes it easy to reason about that way. You don't have to worry about propagation or replication mm -hmm. or any of that. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm going to uh, allow a centralized certificate jail do DNS updates, I've got to do it differently. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, tell us more about that. I'm I'm curious. Yep. So the traditional thing is you can have a one of you, you elect one of your uh, DNS servers as being the master mm -hmm. and all the others are the slaves. And then there's a concept of a hidden master where your master isn't actually one of your registered name servers from your domain, but it's somewhere else. And all your public DNS servers collect from right. it. That means if someone exploits one of your slaves it doesn't affect the other slaves. So, so in effect, you're hiding your master so that people can't get to it and exploit it. You could firewall it off and only allow traffic in from the masters. So that's what I was configuring while I was at BSG CAN. I think this was the, the Wednesday night of BSG CAN. Uh, Matthew Seaman and I were in the hacker lounge and we were trying to figure out why one of my slaves could not talk to one of the other slaves. And we tracked it down to we figured out it must have been something between here and there that was blocking zone file transfers because I could ping it, I could resolve, I could do this, I could do that, but I just couldn't do a zone file transfer. And I think it might have been the firewall. I think the firewall might have been blocking TCP, but I'm, I'm not positive. So eventually he said, why don't you just do this over a VPN instead? And said, well, I already have a VPN. Let me try this. So I just changed the configuration of the name server. So it listened on the VPN address and then did a zone file transfer over the VPN and bang, it worked just like that. So that's when I coined the term very hidden master. I said, I said to uh, Matthew, I said, I still like hidden masters, but now I'm going to try a really hidden master where basically the, the master DNS server has no public access and the slaves access it all over all via VPN. So it's, it's nothing special. It's just a name I gave it. No, I like that. That's so, cute. That's perfect. So now what I'm going to do is when I'm, when I get my let's encrypt, uh, jail going, the, the processes in the jail will talk to let's encrypt. Right. Let's encrypt will say, here's the, DNS record we want you to add. The cert will talk to the hidden, the very hidden master. It will add the text record in there. The hidden master will notify the three slaves. Hey, listen, here's new records for you. It'll update that. Then let's encrypt. will query, make a DNS query. It'll find the text record and say, yep, that's okay. You own that domain. Here you go. Here's your cert. And that'll be done. Beautiful. That sounds really nice. So, and this thank is all you. just living right in a jail um, at your house. The cert, the cert process mm -hmm. is 
is in one jail and the hidden master is in another jail. And then they've got a VPN that connects them together. They've got a VPN. There's already a VPN in, in place. I didn't right. add the VPN right. just for this. Um, Basically a now, private network there that isn't, yes. isn't routable or, yeah. It's actually not routable. Beautiful. So, yeah. Now, what I recently did was convert all my DNS servers over to feed off that hidden master. My next step in Let's Encrypt is to change it from updating one of the uh, public DNS servers, which is what, what I was doing about a week ago, to use this hidden master and then see if it'll propagate all to the other ones. And if that happens, uh, that's the DNS side of Let's Encrypt all done. Then the next stage will be to distribute the certificates I've been given to the various servers and then have those servers restart whatever processes they need, like, uh, say, Postfix, Apache, Dovecot, whatever it might be on that one server. But I reckon I've got maybe another month or a month and a half because I'm only getting a period of two to three hours at a time to work on this. And it's usually sometime over the weekend. And I've still got post-conference stuff to do. So it basically, may take a while. It, basically, it never ends. Once I get this set up, I don't think I'll ever have to install another certificate renewal again. <sighs> That sounds awesome. Yeah, I'm going to have to take some notes here because this seems like a great setup and I need to, uh, it'd be, ni it'd be nice to, to copy what you've done here, have that just automated, keep working, taking around in the background and then yeah. never think about it again. The, um, the NS update connection bit, I, I've got on my blog, it's in the show notes. That, that oh, first yeah. bit about how to uh, issue an NS update and update your server. And there's details in there how to make sure that that connection can only update a text record. It can't add uh, an A record or a pointer or anything like that, only text records. Oh, yeah, right there at the, and, at and, the and, end yeah. there. And add, it, it can add or it can delete. So it might, you know, if someone took over and got that key, they might be able to delete your text records, which might include your SPF and stuff like that. But that's not entirely disastrous. Yeah, exactly. Okay, great. Well, that's. Uh, it sounds like you've had a lot of uh, learned some things, spent some time making things better at home, mod modernizing things a little bit. Are you pretty pleased with the process? Was there anything that you wish had been easier or you think people might get hung up on? The hardest part is zone files syntax. Oh. And that will take you a while to get used to. Um, you will create a host called www.langel.org.langel.org. Okay? You will accidentally <laughs> do that more than once. Yeah. Um, it's an odd I name syntax. all my hosts.langel.org. That's just what yep. I do. Yep. Um, and you will forget to bump the serial. Yep, uh, which is base, basically an ID number that gives you the the it's the ID of, of the changes that you've done, and that that's how slaves know whether or not to update is. Right. Uh, I, I, I for for org, I have serial with this value. What do you have? And they say, oh, I have a bigger value. And right, so it's your way to identify like where in your sync yeah. chain or whatever you you are. And most people use year, month, day. XX, where XX goes zero zero up. Mm -hmm. So and each day just incre increments there, and then you move the is day it value. A four digit year, yeah, it's a four digit year. I would you, can, hope so. you can just use incrementing numbers, but they always have to increment. Right. If they don't increment, you're going to have a hard time. That's the lesson of the day, folks. And you'll do that more than once. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, this is great. Thank you for uh, thank you for sharing your detailed setup here. Uh, it sounds like Let's, Let's Encrypt is working kind of splendidly in this case, now that you've got the DNS automation worked out. It's getting close. It's yeah. getting close. I should have it live by Christmas. <laughs> Look at you setting realistic timelines. All right. Well, everyone in the audience, you stay tuned. Set your calendar reminders right now 
for Christmas 2017. We'll check back in with Dan, see what's happening. I'm sure that's actually going to happen way before then. But if not, hey, we've set a reminder right here. Anything else you want to add before we wrap up? DNS is lots of fun. Everyone should do it. So if you agree with Dan right there, and you should, I think you're going to get along really well with our final sponsor this evening. That's our friends over at ixsystems.com. They're the hardware service. I mean, they do it all. I mean, hardware, full solutions, white glove service. But they're the provider you wish that you had been told about years ago. They've got amazing, incredible, blazing fast Intel processors. They've got amazing vent relationships with all the vendors. They've got talented sales engineers ready, standing by to help you build the server of your dreams. So whether or not you just want to buy a new server to be you know, the, your DNS master, because you really want to start playing with some of the cool technology Dan was just talking about, and you should, you definitely should, or you've heard Dan talk about backups and you're like, ah, my backup situation, it's just not what it should be. May I suggest the FreeNAS Mini. It's simple. It's easy to get started with. It comes with the excellent FreeNAS software. There's the Mini and, all right, well, maybe maybe Mini isn't really your style. Mini just doesn't sound like something that you want to say all the time or talk about on Facebook. Go with the Mini XL. Yeah, Mini XL. It really changes the game, changes how the name sounds, and look at how big it is. It's got an awesome amount of storage. You can, you can, all, you can check it out right here. They've got an awesome video you can watch. They make it really easy to get started and you can go buy it right on Amazon. How, how much simpler could that be? But maybe that's not enough for you. Maybe you're like XL mini XL. No, no, that's not for me. Wes, what are you, what are you talking about? You probably want the true rack. Yeah. Come on over to the true rack. You'll see what IX systems is about. This really showcases that IX systems, they're not like any other vendor. They understand real storage. They understand what petabytes mean. They understand that ZFS is the enterprise file system. They've seen it all. They've been around. They understand FreeBSD, Linux, Windows, like whatever you need, they can set it up. They'll make sure your brand new server, your new NAS, your new SAN, it's all configured appropriately, set up in your data center, plugged in, ready to go first time. And, you know, they think about these things. They, if you're getting a bunch of new disks, they make sure those disks have been tested at their facilities. They've been burned in if they're going to fail, they would have already failed and they would have been swapped out so that you get a system that's ready for production right out of the gate. Because they understand, like, this is your money, this is your business, this is your project. You take it seriously. You deserve to have a custom solution, a solution that's going to work, the solution that's right for you. And they're your partner here. You don't have to know the correct, you know, how many IOPS do I need? Is this going to meet that? How much should I estimate? How much should I overestimate? Is this going to fit in with the controllers that I have in the data center that I'm renting? Uh, there's just so many factors. IX is a great partner here to help you out. They've got their sales engineers right there, ready to help. So ixsystems.com slash techsnap, that's where you need to go. That'll get you started. They've also got a great guide ready to help you out. Or maybe you know someone at your organization who's looking to, you know, they're the one working with your vendors, trying to find some new hardware. You've been frustrated with long wait lines or terrible online ordering or hold been on hold on the phone or the runaround where you just don't get responses to your emails. You won't have any of those problems at ixsystems.com slash techsnap. No, you'll get the definitive guide to buying hardware for open source software, and you're going to have a great time. And you're probably going to learn something, hopefully, about DNS. So thank you to ixsystems for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Hey, and thanks, Dan, for teaching us all a little something. And that brings us to the feedback, the time on the show where we take time to hear from you, our fabulous listeners. First up today, we've got a letter from Eugene, writing about FreeNAS and transferring files locally. I've been enjoying the show and have been an avid listener for the past two years. Oh, thank you for listening. We're glad you're uh, sticking around. On to the question. I've built out a FreeNAS setup specifically for Plex, sharing 64 terabytes raw with eight eight terabyte disks oh we that's pretty cool eugene that's awesome everything is running fine without an issue what i'm trying to do is transfer files locally i have separate external hard drive formatted with ntfs that has files that i would like to transfer to my freenas data store 
I know I can transfer the files via the shared folders from my Windows box, but is there a way to mount the hard drive via USB just to transfer the files from the external HD to my free NAS data store? Thanks, Eugene. What do you think, Mr. Dan? I'm sure there is. There may be a way to do it through the FreeNAS GUI. Mm -hmm. Worst case, you go into a terminal session on the FreeNAS box and you mount it manually. Yeah, what's that, FreeBSD that, support for guess. NTFS? Like, I, that's one thing I've never done on a free, uh, FreeBSD box. Uh, uh, I know there's a, um, for Linux, like NTFS 3G with I, Fuse, you can I, get full support. I missed that bit. Yeah. Do it in MS-DOS instead. Because I know FreeBSD can read and write MS-DOS. But it may be already formatted that way. Reformat it. <laughs> but then he's um, doing two I, transfers. I, yeah, it depends I on know. if he's already... Yeah, exactly. I'm not actually sure. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. So that's that seems like the root of it. I, if you can... I, I, I miss this bit in the question. Well, I mean, it's only a tiny little, tiny detail there. Yeah, I mean, so if you can, you know, if we can figure out how easy it is to get FreeBSD, and I'm sure someone's going to write in to tell us, hey, this is how it works. And if I imagine FreeBSD can use Fuse, is that correct? That's another, I just have, I mean, FreeBSD has ZFS, so I don't, I've never explored other file systems with UFS and ZFS on FreeBSD, I'm ashamed to say. Um, so I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, if you can, you know, it'll, I imagine it would require going into the terminal, mounting it, doing a copy. Yeah making sure it's not, owned by the right user. But then after yeah. that, it should be straightforward. Yes, I'm not sure if it can read or write it, and I would have to do some more research. I'll, I'll have a look. Maybe someone in the channel is going to do that. But yeah, if we go on to the next question, I'll have a look. That sounds uh, very appropriate. Okay, on to the next question. This is a letter from our friend Ben writing about password managers filling in credentials. I want to suggest that getting your password manager to fill in your details may not be as bad as you've suggested, but I'd be interested for your thoughts and comments. I use 1Password over several devices. On each device, I either have an OS or browser extension that lets me get 1Password to fill in the credentials for me. It does not do it automatically. I have to command it to fill them in. The password manager has two interesting safeguards. One, if the domain doesn't match the one that the credentials were saved with, it either won't fill in the details or will warn you that the domain is different. And two, it will remind you that when the credentials were first saved, the site was using HTTPS, but the login form you are trying to fill in is currently only HTTP. I think it also warns about saving passwords in plain HTTP, but I'm not 100%. The two safeguards above have helped me a couple of times when I've not been the most alert, first thing in the morning, last thing at night, etc. You know, anytime you're in a hurry. And it saved me from convincing phishing attempts and also saved me from entering credentials on sites that have messed up their SSL certs. Saving my credentials from being transmitted in the clear. In both of these cases, the password manager has helped me retain the integrity of my credentials. Whereas if I simply copy and pasted my credentials, I would have to rely on myself becoming more alert, something I think most of us fail to be at certain times. Furthermore, because it only fills in one set of credentials per page, it asks you to select if there are multiple matches, and it only fills in the credentials when I command it to, I think this mitigates from injection as suggested by one of last week's feedbacks. Am I giving my password manager too much credit? Can you still see flaws that I've been blind to? Lastly, I understand not all managers are equal. Features found in one may be lacking in others. Always worth considering when talking about a category of products. As always, thanks for the show, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Much appreciated for your feedback there. I think it's been a very interesting discussion. What do you think over there, Dan? Ben likes one password. That's true. Sounds like he's gotten a lot of use out of it. And yeah, some of the features there are very nice. I like those. I still wouldn't allow an app. See, it's not just that the app... It's just not that the password manager is auto-filling. It's that something else can go in and ask it to auto-fill. Or ask... I just don't like anything that allows 
an app to fill in fields automatically. I don't like that at all. Now, sure, I see some safeguards in here. Mm -hmm. Would I use it? Probably not. But I'm I am not full disclosure a one password user. Right. And I still don't think I would enable it. And just because I say don't do it doesn't mean you don't have to do it. I explain the reasons why I don't do it, and then you choose. And yeah, I am talking a, about a whole category of products here unashamed, unashamedly, <laughs> without remorse. Yeah. No, I mean, I think I think this. I, I'm. I really appreciate this piece of feedback. Um, I think it's. It, you know, it really is a spectrum where. You know, it, it's just good to be informed. It sounds like the one password manager is doing an, a, a pretty good job, and I think that's a reasonable security trade off to make, um, and can help some users. You know, there there may be a segment of users that this is better or safer than they could manage themselves, or they may not be competent enough or interested to use a less convenient password manager uh, to the full extent or properly or securely. So it would be helpful. People who may not know how to check the, you know, HTTPS Mm -hmm. green Mm -hmm. logo and lock and understand how the certificates work and all those Mm -hmm. things. So there may be some ways where that could actually be really helpful. Um, it's just really good to be informed about what those practices are, how far it goes, what does the API between browser or plugin and the backend system look like. All of those are worth considering, and and exactly what you're talking about. Once there is programmatic access, you're opening yourselves up to to attacks and that kind of thing. So, I think in a lot of cases, it, it's it's probably probably worth it. And if it helps, if it if those kinds of convenience features help people start using password managing services or password managers, then I think I'm I'm for it. Uh, but something everyone should be aware of: that there can be downsides. Anytime you're opening these things up, you're you know trusting machines and algorithms versus your own judgment, which can sometimes be the, the right choice, but it should be something that you make consciously. Yep. Anything I'm, else you I'm want? I'm sure one password is great. Yeah. I've, it, th- this is not a qualm about any particular password manager. It's just general statement. And sometimes general statements are general. <laughs> yeah, r- yeah, exactly. Yeah, ex- and so like if you can't, you know, if you, you have investigated these things, you're like, yeah, look, They've, they've reasonably mitigated most of my concerns. They've added these layers of protections and security. It's not just blindly filling things in. Then, hey, yeah, sounds like a really nice solution. And uh, keep letting us know how it works. Thank you very much for your letter, Ben. Thank you, Ben. On to the next thing in the mailbag. Oh, oh, just a second. Yeah. I added a link in the show notes to SysUchills FuseFS NTFS. It allows you to mount NF, NTFS partitions, read, write, and disk images. So it's in the FreeBSD ports tree, and I think that's what you want to look at. That was for uh, the previous thing. Ah, uh, here Freenas. we go. Oh, oops, nope, that's the wrong size. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay, so you can install the NTFS 3G driver mm-hmm. on, on FreeBSD there. Looking at what else it requires, it's a few other things there, but I'm... I would go into the FreeNAS forums and ask in there, but I'm sure that this this solution may be involved. But the FreeNAS forums will send you right or confirm my theory. That makes sense. All right. Well, on to the next piece of feedback then. Um, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce the name. Uh, Graham? Graham? Graham. Graham? Graham. Ah, that makes sense. Oh, now I see. I misread that. Anyway, we're writing about episode 323 and our discussion of the yellow dots and color printers, which you may recall. Color photography, ah, color photocopiers, excuse me, have had the encoding for years. It was mandated by the government to prevent them, prevent using them to counterfeit money. I deployed some 20 years ago and the encoding was highlighted by the vendor representative. We were required to inform all operators of the fact that this was happening. They were not required to inform end users. Well, Graham, thank you very much for your letter. Yep, that pretty much, I think, confirms what we were were talking about. It's been a long-standing practice. I I remember that. I remember that, and I'd totally forgotten about it when we were reading those articles. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I mean, I know there's a lot of various safeguards in very in, in you know different software and hardware systems for exactly that kind yep. of counterfeiting the, use case. 
There was another feedback item that I didn't fill in. They talked about it not needing to be yellow. Um, you can also, you know, if you have a 600 DPI printer, you can just do individual dots somewhere. They don't have to be very, they can be, you're not going to see them. In a 600 DPI uh, printer, just black and white, you can put those dots on there as well. Interesting. Yeah, we were kind of speculating about that, so that's that's good to know. Mm. Huh. Scary stuff. It is scary stuff. Yeah, because I was just thinking about that. It's amazing how small modifications and how how good we've gotten as a species at trying to you know picking out the signal from the noise and those things and tiny minute markers and metadata we can use to identify things yeah. these days. Uh, I'm not so powerful, sure why but... it's needed on black and white though. If it's to to preempt counterfeiting. Right. It seems like at that point you're cutting off some of those things and you're mm-hmm. really in the like um, origin and um, provenance tracking I've, sort of territory. I, I've also heard about copyright, uh, about photocopiers being able to recognize currency and said, oh, mm-hmm. no, I'm not photocopying that. I think even Photoshop uh, had some of those things here where like they would uh, uh, prevent you from doing certain things with uh scans of money not yeah. sure if that's the case but i've read about that photo no I, i've seen copiers mm-hmm. um there's a certain uh constellation pattern that, that is in a given currency and the copiers recognize that and don't reproduce it that makes sense i thought while you're reading this next one i'll look that up perfect okay on to the next one then Ah, here we go. From Graham again. Uh, Here we're writing about episode 322. Windows privacy. Not so private. You cannot turn off Windows 10 telemetry with a group policy. Level 0 is not off. It's just basic. Even these settings are available only in Pro, Enterprise, and the Education Editions. The Home Edition cannot even use these lower levels. There is a registry hack to disable telemetry, but it is also disabling Windows Update, which uh, obviously, if you watch this show, is not desirable. Furthermore, there are several other functions in Windows which send data back to Microsoft outside of telemetry. Telemetry is just one of many. And note, Microsoft can pull files from your system, even enterprise machines, using telemetry to gather malware samples. They do not need permission to do so and do not notify you when it is done. A corporation can subscribe to Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection to gain visibility into this data for forensic analysis purposes. And then he provides a link for more information about advanced threat protection. Uh, It looks like here is a sample of of what that data might look like. Oh, here's the levels he's referring to. Level, uh, data gathered value security, security data only. So you have that basic, enhanced, full. uh, And then another link here to uh, more things about how to configure Windows telemetry in your organization. Yeah, it's kind of amazing if you look at like Windows 7 and then Windows 10, how much on the surface they're very similar and a lot of things, you know, it feels like a slightly modernized, cleaned up version of what had come before. But under the hood, there's a lot more of this cloud connected advertiser ID, telemetry. It really is almost an internet first, cloud first um, operating system in some ways. Like, I, we just, I haven't seen that kind of shift in some of the other, I mean, it feels like even, maybe OS X is kind of going those down those roads towards, you know, a little more of being like iOS, but not, I don't even think the, in the, in the same amount, you know, Linux desktops or FreeBSD desktops or other things like Windows has really blazed that trail towards tracking and online integration and online first. I mean, like, you know, when you install it these days, it'll prompt you with, like, sign in with your Microsoft account and start start the cloud connection just right there. I don't know. What do you think, Dan? Oh, Dan, are you muted over there? You might be muted. Am I? Come back I'm to sorry. us. Now you're back. I'm sorry. I muted you while I was typing on my keyboard. Out of con- yeah, it's so polite. Um, anything which 
increases privacy is a good idea. And I'm glad that we've got this stuff in here. But why why allow enterprise to do something that you won't allow individuals to do, and especially in terms of privacy? Um, all operating systems should allow you to be anonymous. There's no reason for this tracking. Yeah. And I mean, I it seems really like really like it to go away. Yeah, and it seems like there's some compromises that could be made in a lot of these cases. Like, yeah, okay, enable have that feature exist. Sure, if people want to use it, if you want to connect your cloud account, okay, great, do so. But don't require me to. Don't shove it down our throats, so to speak. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. I think exactly what you're saying. Like, we shouldn't we shouldn't be required to have those things. We should have reasonable options. And exactly this, to your point about the enterprise, like, yeah, enterprise is probably much more likely to want that data or have a business case to need that data for auditing purposes or compliance or, or whatever that the home user wouldn't. But it really goes a long way. Like, you don't have to you don't have to make that the default. You don't have to. But if you just have the option instead of ex- outright excluding the home user, you know, that would make me not that I'm going to go out and use Windows. But if I yeah. were required to, I would feel a lot better about it if I even had those options. Yeah, it's it's. We're becoming commodities, and we shouldn't be. Yeah. I can see commoditizing something when you're providing a service, such as Gmail, mm-hmm. but you've paid for Windows. <laughs> right, yeah. It came as part of your device, or you actually explicitly bought mm-hmm. a license. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. That's a very good point. Uh, all right. Well, that's uh, that's the feedback. Anything else you want to add? Thank you. If anyone else knows about information like this about how you can provide better personal space security for individuals please let us know about stuff like this Thank absolutely you. we really appreciate it feedback's one of the best segments of this show and uh, i love the connection with the and, audience and i added to the show notes the constellation i was talking about um, it's been incorporated into a number of banknote designs worldwide since about 1996. It is added to help imaging software detect the presence of a banknote in a digital image. Such software can then block the user from reproducing banknotes to prevent counterfeiting and using f- color photocopiers. Oh, yeah, that looks familiar. Look at that. Helping protect our fiat money. Yep. Thank Pretty you, cool. technology. All so right. at the bottom is a list of all, you know, it's in the Canadian dollar, well, was. So we'll see. <laughs> right. It's a lot harder to counterfeit Canadian funds now because it's this, uh, it's not a paper or fabric-based currency. It's uh, plastic. Right, yeah, it's all plastic now. Extremely oh. thin and slippery. Mm-hmm. You need pretty industrial stuff to to make it in the first place, I think. Yep. Yeah, interesting. And it looks cool, too. So that's there's that. Oh, yes, it does. Okay, so that wraps up the feedback. If you would like to send us feedback, you can go to techsnap.reddit.com or jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. There you'll find a form. You can send us your feedback. We'll go through it and put it on the show. That gives you an outlet to, hey, complain or compliment. We prefer those. That's just a little, little tip. Dan, Dan likes compliments, turns out. I don't, I don't know. Um, and <laughs> actually, what we really love is, uh, you know, all, all the cool things you guys know about, the tips, the tricks, the experience you've had really improves the show. So thank you very much to the people who have reached out, and uh, please feel free to do so. And stay tuned. We'll be right back with the Roundup. And that brings us to the final segment of today's show. That's right. It's time for everyone's favorite, the Roundup. Dan, I think we've got a good Roundup today. There's a lot of things we've touched on before, or they're they're just kind of neat. First up, though, I saw um, this when you linked it to me, and it just it just freaked me out a little. I, the, the image, it's yeah. just... Yeah. Look at those. Sco- sc- scroll, scroll. Look at those eyes. Don't look at them too long. Oh, God. Okay, right off the them. screen. Okay, what? Okay. What? I, I couldn't get past that. So what is this first one about? So it is about the NSA has linked the WannaCry computer worm, which we talked about at least two different shows, to North Korea. Now, you have to keep in mind that linking a given activity, you're not actually linking it to the government. You're linking it to a group. 
when you're investigating cyber stuff, you notice patterns. And you say, oh, yeah, this is very typical of this group. And you give the group a name, not because you know who they are, but because you have to refer to that group. It's kind of boring calling them group A and group B. So basically, you say, usually group A is all... uh, we, we think group A is North Korean because of these reasons, not because North Korea has actually come out and said that, you know, this is our group. But there's just hints and traces as to why someone is associated with a given country. And the fact that sometimes software comes out, which is so advanced, it can, the conclusion is it could only be a state actor to have the kind of funds and resources it takes to get behind it. But anyway. That part is not the important part. The important part is they're saying that they suspect that the cyber actor, the assessment states that cyber actors suspected to be sponsored by the RGB were behind two versions of WannaCry. And the other interesting thing in here is although the hackers raised about $140,000 in Bitcoin, none of it has been cashed in. I didn't know this until this. None of them have been cashed in because of an likely because of an operational error that has made the transactions easy to track, including by law enforcement. As a result, no online currency exchange will touch it. So they made some sort of mistake that made it trackable, which means that no one is going to cash it in for them, which means they can't cash it in. It's basically like taking numbered bills from a bank robber. You you just can't. So, yeah, that's about it in, in, in this. That's about all that I read through. So have a read of this. See what you think of it. It should be very interesting. Excellent. All right. Thank you. That, uh, that is very interesting. I'm sure it seems like that story is just going to keep coming up on this program. And that's a good thing. For quite some time, yeah, I think. I think so. Okay. On to the next piece of Auto Roundup. Over at uh, Tenable.com's blog, they've got an article by Jacob Baines about routing a printer from security bulletin to remote code execution. And I thought this was just a really neat little rundown of um, some of the research they did. You know, they start talking about, like, printers. They're everywhere. Big businesses, schools, homes, blah, blah, blah. Um, And they saw an HP potential security vulnerability that had been identified with certain HP printers, um, and it could be used to exploit Mm-hmm. You know, and execute arbitrary code. Uh, so they went out and and identified which versions of the firmware were vulnerable, and they wanted they wanted to try to play with this, figure out you know what was going on. So they went out and bought some of these printers just to play with them. Uh, you know, always willing to indulge our curiosity, we purchased a couple of printers listed in the advisory. In this case, yep. HP OfficeJet Pro eighty two tens, and then they pursue they start poking around. Uh, Thankfully, both printers arrived with vulnerable firmware installed. They hadn't been updated at the factory or anything like that. Uh, And then they start poking around. So they do some Nmap here, which is fun. And they find that, um, you know, there's port 9100 open, which is is described as HP proprietary. But it's it's widely known that on HP printers, this supports raw printing and like PCL, PostScript, and PJL. In particular, they start showing some PJL interactions over here. Um, And they reference a paper about exploiting network printers, a survey of security flaws in laser printers and multifunction devices. What follows is really a great way. Like, it just shows how they've been poking around with Netcat. They eventually write some Python scripts. You can see here that they run some um, PJL commands, and you can start trying to do some directory traversal. So you'll see, like, Mm -hmm. hey, let's navigate up a couple directories. Can we get anywhere? And what follows is they basically find kind of a standard Linux file system but they yep. don't have write access, they eventually find a little bit of overlap, and it turns out to be like a profile.d directory. Um, and so the PGL commands let them upload files that, you know, normally you would use this fs upload command uh, in order to upload a file that you want to print. Uh, but they use it to upload stuff into the profile.d, and then they use an SNMP command to trigger a reboot, which then reboots the printer, that, you know, on boot, that user's profile.d gets run, and then they've got themselves a root shell. And it works, it works just like that. It's just a, it's just a really neat break, breakdown. They've got a lot of good screen captures and command, um, you know, show you the nmap commands they use, netcat, they show you the Python script. So I just thought it was really, makes it all very accessible, some of those 
you see people like analyzing firmwares and doing that stuff, and sometimes it seems like magic, but at the end of the day, it really is relying on a lot of the primitives that um, sysadmins and other types that, that we use every day. This is cool. Also, it should remind you that like, it's not just your computer that you need to patch. It turns out all of our devices are now computers, and you should patch them too. So patch your shit, everybody. Listen to Dan. Just do what just do what yes. Dan, just do yes. what Dan says. That's the theme of the patch show. Up. Yeah. Okay. With that, uh, that was uh, almost uh, almost a little bit too much for a roundup. I apologize, but I thought it was an interesting article. On to how to secure your laptop, Linux laptop, yeah. maybe for travel. The specific use case that he's talking about is a conference in Beijing. He's going to China, and he is worried about having st- confidential information on his laptop. And he specifically says that China is not a signatory to the personal use exemption when it comes to encrypted devices. So bringing a laptop with an encrypted hard drive with you is not technically legal. And basically, if you don't unencrypt it, it may result in unpleasantness. But then he, he disclaims that it's important to point out why, that you are extremely unlikely to be penalized for bringing in an encrypted laptop with you to China, as any widespread zealous application of such practice would quickly shut down any business travel to China. And this is definitely not in the government's interest. But you really don't want anything to piss off any border people anywhere. Basically, they have control over you. And yeah, this guy is being very, very cautious. And their suggestion was to bring a Chromebook. Now, th- this is only if you're worried about the information that you have on you. Basically, he says, buy, buy a Chromebook, uh, reinstall the OS so that it's not encrypted because by default it'll encrypt it and they don't want that. So, isn't that a great Reinst- problem to have? Oh, whoops, my default is encrypted. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Um, but how does that work with cell phones? Yeah, exactly. Because cell phones are, iPhone content is encrypted by default. Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically, the gist of what, what he does is he um, brings, he, he plans to reinstall once he gets to China. And then have that encrypted. And then when he gets back, dispose of the Chromebook. Why he wants to dispose of it just depends on how, how much you trust it and whether or not you think it's been exploited. But basically, any time you're going somewhere like this and you are concerned about that type of espionage, you want to keep your laptop with you at all times. Because having physical access to your laptop allows you to do a whole lot more than just having electronic access to it. Um, and yeah, um, each use case is different. Yeah, and, I'll, uh, and I'll, I, I'll note that the the person whose blog we're reading here is uh, like a goes by Mister Murikon, Mister Icon. I'm not sure, but uh, Konstantin Rybitsev, and he works for the Linux Foundation and has done some like Linux kernel development and other things. So mm-hmm. I think there's you know there there's some of the reasons that you might have for being being this conscious con, uh, conscious um, and you know having these kinds of concerns. Yes. I do. I did like how you opened that there, and there is some sort of note. Um, looking at some of the discussion online about this uh, blog post, some people comparing, you know, saying talking about how much of a worse experience and how much more likely they felt they were going to be searched or that their laptops would be searched going through a U.S. airport as compared to mm-hmm. a Chinese airport. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, there there are different threats in terms of state actors mm-hmm. versus commercial interests versus. So, but I think in general, this this blog post is just a good idea of. If you really are paranoid, you have reason to be paranoid. These are some of the things you should start thinking about internalizing and maybe adapting your workflow to. Thankfully, for a lot of us, you know, people watching this show, us, if a lot of your, you know, a lot of your day to day involves a terminal and a web browser, a Chromebook is maybe serviceable, especially if you're only going to be traveling for, you know, a week or two. Then not great, but yep. I know I've seen some people who, you know, do this maybe Chromebook or you could get like a maybe a used ThinkPad if that's available in the region that you're traveling with and then, you know, buy it off Craigslist or the local equivalent and try to sell it again before you leave or just get rid of it. It is unfortunate we live in a world where these kinds of considerations are kind of commonplace. Yes. <sighs> okay, well, with that, I'd like to end the show on like a little bit happier note. So, yes. Freenas 11. Yay. is now here. Yeah, that's right. 
That's right. I know there's been some confusion around this, uh, especially with the last release and, and some of the confusion there, but it's here. It's official. Free NAS. It is an S3 compatible server. Ooh, look at that. Look at that fun shark too. That's like a lot of, that's a lot of fun. Mm. All right. Well, I really thought there'd be some things more than the shark here. I think it gets started. You can go, you can go watch the video at home, but there's S3 compatible things. Uh, they've improved a lot of stuff. Uh, it also introduces the beta version of a new administration GUI. It's based on the Angular framework. They expect that the GUI will be themable and feature complete by 11.1. So really there's like a lot in the works here. I'm excited to see, you know, after you should go back and watch, um, you know, the free BSD program and them talking with, with Chris Moore and their interview BSD there. now. BSD now. What am I saying? Yes. Thank you. Um, because that, that'll explain a lot of the, the backstory for this this story, but it's great to see them coming forward with what should be the next stable release, seeing what that looks like, getting excited about that, because I think there's a lot of people that really love the FreeNAS platform and wanted to see it and were a little bit confused about what happened. So it's good to have a, you know, a strong arm forward here. Have you tried it out? No, I don't have FreeNAS at home. Well, you already have um, FreeBSD, so I guess you're covered. I, I've got big free PSD servers. This is a different use case mm -hmm. for, than, than what I've got. Um, one line I see here, it says, testing indicates that the kernel of FreeNAS 11 is 20% faster than the kernel of FreeNAS 9.1. That's significant. Yeah, that is significant. Wow, that's, that's kind of awesome. Well, I'm pretty happy to see that release and, uh, you know, it's always nice to to see the latest updates from FreeNAS and the and the people at IX behind them. So awesome! And uh, I think that's a natural point to end this here show. If you have tried out the new version of FreeNAS, let us know. Give us your feedback. You can find more of this program over at JupiterBroadcasting.com. Uh, the there's the archive. There's the calendar, which will let you know when we're here live. And there's the contact form, and that's how you let us know how much you love FreeNAS 11, how much you hate our coverage of it, or any other thought that's on your mind. If it's interesting, we'd love to put it on the show. If you have experience with some of the tools we've talked about, you've got criticisms, you've got tips, it's all wonderful. If you want more Dan, he's at TechSnap underscore Dan. You should also go follow his blog where he might update you more about his DNS situation or other fun precursors to this here program. And I'm at Wes Payton. This has been episode 324 on June 20th, 2017. Dan, do you have anything else before we uh, go home tonight? Nope. Have fun. Be safe. Yeah. Enjoy learning DNS. <laughs> See you all next week. <laughs>